we're going to be having a really exciting panel on future embedded systems. Um, a bit of bookkeeping. Uh, you could use the Zoom Q&A for asking questions, but uh, uh, they don't work really well. So I would recommend everyone to post their questions on the Slack channel. And the Slack channel is uh, SICOM 2020 panel embedded. So we have a very interesting set of people on this panel, a very diverse set of people on this panel uh, uh, to talk about embedded systems and the future of embedded systems. Uh, we have Luca from Italy, who uh, is an expert in embedded systems and more recently has been working on nano satellites and CubeSats. We have Tanzine Chaudhary, who is a professor at Cornell Tech. She's, an, she's one of the experts in mobile health and embedded systems and mobile systems and has had significant impact in that domain. And finally, everyone, I'm Sham Golakota from the University of Washington. And I have worked on things like backscatter communication. And more recently, I've been working on bio-inspired and bio-integrative embedded systems. So just to give some context for what this panel is about, it's about embedded systems. And if you look at the traditional definition of embedded systems, it's about embedding, computing, sensing, and communication into everyday objects. And this includes the most conventional things which we are all familiar with, such as the Nest uh, temperature sensor, the ring cameras, or a variety of different sensors we all use for our security systems. This is what's been the traditional Internet of Things or embedded systems, which has mostly been about having communication and some sensor, like a temperature sensor, which is providing the information and sending it to the cloud. Um, but the whole hypothesis of this specific panel is that the next gen embedded systems are going to go beyond just sensing. In particular, we are going to start talking about things which can actually move embedded systems which can actually move. So here is one of the systems which we built where we can have the system uh, which is as small as a robo fly, which can lift off and actually move. And it has computing, it has communication, and it has sensing embedded into it. Or you, we, are, we are also increasingly seeing wireless systems that are embedded and integrated with living insects, uh, such as bees, so that they can collect data about what's happening in a farm. And more recently, we're also seeing things where we can uh, create hybrid insect robots, which are all again embedded systems. Uh, so in this video, what you're going to see is a robotic arm which can move and you can collect a, a, a panoramic view of what's actually happening, a panoramic video of what's actually happening, and it's streaming that to a, a mobile, mobile phone. So it's not just limited to uh, micro robots, the future of embedded systems. You're also seeing increasingly work, uh, which Luca is going to talk about, where wireless systems are being embedded into nano satellites. Um, and things which Tanzim is going to talk about, which is how we can actually embed systems uh, to enable healthcare. So this is basically the cover of Nature Medicine from June of this year, where they talk about wireless biosensors, which can be used for neonatal ICUs. So we have an exciting variety of different topics which are going to be covered for embedded systems. And the way we're going to structure this panel is that we're going to have Luca and uh, Tanzim talk, into, talk about three to five minutes about the kind of work they're doing so that they can provide better context for uh, SICOM. And then we're going to open the, uh, the floor for questions. With that, uh, Luca, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Uh, Shirm, are you going to share the screen yourself with my slides as we agreed? Oh, it's already, it's already sharing. The screen is already sharing. Uh, but I still see your last slide. I don't know if it's only me or what. Uh, I think it's, it's showing me the beyond the clouds embedded software for nano satellites. Uh, okay. Well, whatever, let's, let's go ahead. I still see yours. Anyways, um, so first of all, I wanted to thank you, Shem, for, for the invitation. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'll be real quick, as I just want to throw out a few things and then, then open the floor for discussions. So what I'm going to talk about is something that really excites me, 
uh, it's a very interdisciplinary area with lots of uncharted territory and it's not a fun. Uh, so please next. Uh, so let me uh, start off by telling you what we are exactly going to talk about next. So a nano satellite is, is nothing but a satellite with, with a certain size and weight restrictions. Uh, for example, we talk about nano satellites where we are considering devices that weigh less than 10 kilos. Uh, and among them, among nano satellites, there's a sort of standard that is emerging with what we call CubeSats, where each device is, is guess what, is a cube of exactly 10 centimeter in size and it must weigh between one and 1.3 kilos roughly. And these, these specific features are there for a reason, uh, because they greatly facilitate loading these, these devices on the launch rockets that are the vehicles that put the devices into space. And it makes their deployment a lot easier when, it, when you are reaching the target orbit and it's time for the launch rocket to release the device. Uh, next. So a, a typical, you may, wondering, you may be wondering what, what is the payload for these devices. So typically a CubeSat is carrying, uh, is carrying a camera for remote sensing, a set of small solar panels and, and some RF subsystem for communication. Uh, because, of, because of the size and the weight constraints, now CubeSat has very strict limitations in terms of energy consumption, processing power and communication capabilities. Uh, which is where actually we and better system people come in and then the fun begins for, for, for people like us. So next, I wanted to give you a couple of examples now of the kind of work we have been doing in, in this area. Next. The one problem we have been working on is, is how to perform energy efficient localization in space. So CubeSats uh, have a GPS, pretty much like your smartphone, that are used for both application level positioning and for the general navigation once uh, the target orbit is reached. Uh, typically, you would use duty cycling for achieving better energy efficiency for the GPS receiver. Uh, the problem is, uh, unless the local time and information about the visible GPS constellations are known a priori, what you normally need to do is to search for all visible GPS satellites, estimate the Doppler shifts, and correlate the so-called pseudo-random noise codes, the PRN codes that are unique for each of the satellites. Now the scenario is a little bit different compared to when you're on Earth because a CubeSat may actually travel at eight kilometers per second at 500 kilometers from the Earth. Uh, and the GPS satellites themselves, they move around at about four kilometers per second. So the receiver and the transmitter move relatively to each other really fast. Um, the CubeSats do not have a sophisticated navigation system, so you, what you end up with in most of the cases is that the CubeSat keeps spinning on itself, it keeps tumbling around the orbit. That makes things a lot worse for estimating the Doppler shift, uh, which becomes extremely large, and it will take you a lot of time before you get the first fix. Now, this may actually take up to 30 plus minutes for you. And duty cycling uh, makes no sense in that scenario because if you want to keep the GPS on for half an hour just to get a first fix, uh, then there's no reason to shut it off at all. So what we have developed uh, is, is a hardware software system called Hummingbird, uh, which we are going to present at Mobicom in, in a couple of months, where we have a motion estimation technique based on uh, data that you load on a microcontroller before launch that allows us to reduce the time to get the first fix from like half an hour up to tens of seconds. And that is a great improvement in terms of energy efficiency when it comes to the figure that goes into the GPS receiver. Next. So another problem we've been working on is how to understand when and what goes wrong on a CubeSat. Um, the opportunities to communicate down to the earth are very slim because the bandwidth is extremely constrained and the radio operation is also energy consuming. So forget about anything like a periodic ping down to the earth saying, hey, I'm here, I'm alive. 
Um, but what's most challenging is that whatever monitoring system you want to deploy, it must be as decoupled as possible from the CubeSat because you don't want to affect the operation of the CubeSat because of the monitoring system. And in addition to that, you want to have an easy way to convince the people who are going to put your device on a launch rocket, nothing is going to go wrong just because of your monitoring system. Um, we've been working on this very challenging problem for a lot. And now we have a solution that we call the, the, the smart CubeSat tracker that is completely detached from the CubeSat, meaning that there's not even an electrical connection to the CubeSat. It's all about passive probing, understanding from like the outside of the CubeSat, how the CubeSat is doing. Uh, and through a separate RF communication system, we can send down the very minimum amount of information that allows us to understand whether everything is fine or not up there. Next. So I'm really only scratching the surface here. Um, there's a lot more uh, into this area, both to be researched and to be discovered in a way. And as I mentioned at the beginning, what I like the most here is that you, you, you get to talk to people with a very different background than, than the embedded system. You need to talk to aerospace engineers, you need to talk to uh, the people in charge of the launch station. Um, and often it's really two different languages that need to come to a common agreement. Um, next, if you wanna know more, about what we're doing in this area, you are welcome to check out the website of our lab at www.nestlab.it. Um, yeah, and that's, that's it from my side. Next, uh, I'll be happy to answer questions. All right, thank you so much, Luca. Uh, next, we're going to have Tanzim talk about mobile health and embedded systems. Okay, thanks, Sham. Uh, uh, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, a, a specific aspect of mobile health where I think there is a lot of kind of opportunities of new innovation, particularly in terms of um, going beyond embedded sensing to embedded actuation and uh, what particularly as we as we kind of move into um, the, the new world of, I would say, health where um, a lot of measurement and actuation is happening in person's own environment, so in an immersive context. Um, and what, what from our perspective, um, we saw some of the gaps, and I'll give one simple example, but I just want to um, kind of position that the, uh, this area where I think there's a lot more opportunities for doing kind of innovative, innovative work. So going to the next slide, there has been a lot of uh, technical advances um, in health and health sensing, uh, particularly, um, and there has been parallel uh, advances in in the clinical side. But um, I think some of sometimes these happen in parallel with a lot uh, with not as much crosstalk and iterative design that needs to happen. And going to the um, next uh, slide, one one of the things that we have been kind of actively trying to do for many years is, is really make that an iterative process to understand um, where the sensing and, and actuation can have impact and, and how do we design a system that could actually be adopted and used um, widely. So one uh, thing that I wanted to highlight is I would say we've, we've done um, uh, made huge progresses in in the context of measurement right so there is a lot of work in in sensing that now can uh, capture a lot of aspects of health but where I would say there is still a big gap is how do you intervene on someone's health um, so if we go to the next slide I would say that there is a huge set if you go look for even apps there's huge uh, slew of apps out there that is claiming to do um, intervention. But I would say that the, the sensing and intervention still are not very intimately coupled beyond some uh, what I call simple bookkeeping, right? That you have an, a 
achieved your goal. These are my suggestions uh, that uh, from the app from based on mining your data. Um, and kind of going next is that uh, what we want to see is how do we close that kind of gap and have a continuous loop and not just something that is looking at summaries and trends, but it is it is doing continuous measurement and intervention. So if we go to the, the next slide, I would say we want to kind of mimic uh, the trajectory of, of how we went from sensing, right? If we think about health sensing in, in the natural environment, right, before sensing, right, people would log and journal, and it is still used in, in the health context of when the doctor asks you to log or journal certain behavior, going to the next kind of um, version, the, the phone kind of revolutionized that, but first step by just making it easy for someone to log, and then go, uh, the next step was where the sensing came is made it invisible, right? You did not have to um, put a lot of effort into recording every aspect Aspect of your behavior and that was done uh, with uh, the phone is one example but the embedded sensing enabled us to really uh, make that process very easy and seamless for for the user so now can we do that same thing for intervention, right? I would say that health intervention technologies now as we have it, particularly in a, in a person's natural environment is expecting too much for us, uh, uh, from us. Um, so going to the next slide, one of the things that we have been kind of thinking about, can we design intervention that doesn't always require us to be consciously aware and, and acting on what is being measured. So if you think about sensing, right, the sensing is happening passively, it's not putting burden on us, but in all of the uh, intervention that is designed, it requires us to process that information and make a decision and act on that. Um, so are there opportunities to doing that invisibly similar to uh, sensing. And I'll give one example, and I think there are a broader um, set of things that we could be working on, is we wanted to look at um, uh, impacting physiological signals. So for example, we can measure heart rate, breathing rate, other physiological sensing. Can we, act, um, can we influence that through kind of embedded actuation? So um, there is a whole notion in psychology which calls the interoceptive awareness is how people are aware of their internal bodily changes, not always consciously, but they're kind of, um, um, some are more aware than others. And there has been some literature that shows that people who are more aware of their physiological changes can be more prone to anxiety and depression because um, they, as soon as their heart starts uh, pounding, they become even, it, it's a kind of a feedback loop where they get more anxious. So. One example we wanted to do is if we are continuously, next slide, um, measure, can we try to actually influence that signal in real time to impact um, someone's uh, anxiety? And ultimately, if we can, um, impact uh, instantaneous anxiety level, then it might also have secondary impact of improving like alertness, concentration, uh, performance. So, Next slide. What we did is where we were um, constantly looking, it's a very simple example of measuring um, someone's heart rate during stressful tasks. So here, someone's heart beating at 110 beats per minute. Um, you can have some kind of actuation, and in this case, tactile uh, feedback that is happening that mimics that heart rate. But what you can also do is going to the next slide, is uh, um, change, alter that signal. So let's say if you slow it down and give feedback at uh, slower than what your actual heart rate is, does that actually have a calming effect on you? So what we actually saw, going to the next slide, um, and we've done this experiment in um, several contexts with hundreds of users, is you can actually uh, impact person's uh, anxiety level, self-reported measures of anxiety, and you can go both ways. You can actually increase anxiety or also decrease by um, giving that um, feedback. Going to the next slide, not only can you um, look at um, the self-perception of it, actual physiological change happens. So by giving that continuous adaptive feedback, you can actually change a person's um, kind of heart rate. 
and, and the impact of that, we have done that in the context of a, um, a math test, if you go to the next slide, um, that you can actually change performance. So we saw that you can improve a person's uh, performance in the test by doing this continuous kind of measurement and intervention. So I want to kind of leave that. We are exploring various ways you can think about. Um, we could constantly measure sleep. Can you measure um, uh, do better sleep intervention this way. Um, there are aspects of it that, that can be used in rehabilitation uh, where you're constantly measuring and trying to actuate to um, uh, lead to better outcome. There is actually things that are used in um, um, gait and rehabilitation using kind of acoustic rhythmic effect. And I think there is opportunities of doing sensing and intervention there as well. So uh, I want to kind of uh, uh, kind of put out the call that as we develop more and more richer sensing, um, thinking about ways where um, um, similar to kind of Sham uh, start in the beginning talking about kind of bio-inspired you know, sensing and also beyond just sensing movement, I think um, there is a lot of opportunities of integrating sensing and actuation in a closed loop system that actually makes health intervention in the wild um, really acceptable and scalable without putting a lot of burden on the user. I'll, I'm going to stop there and uh, we can kind of move into session. All right. Um, so uh, we're going to open the uh, open it up for questions. Please post your questions on the Slack channel. Uh, I'm going to stop the sharing of the thing. I'm going to start with the first question for actually Tanzim. I really found this concept of closing the loop. Uh, to some extent, which basically you're having a sensor is just not sensing the data and just giving you information, but it's also kind of uh, actuating and kind of changing the loop for you, this is, which is very fascinating. I think that's the next uh, uh, future of uh, mobile health. I guess the question I have for you is, because we're in SICOM, can you articulate a little bit more of the systems level challenges, mobile systems level challenges one would face when we have to add what are the challenges in making this uh, this happen? Yeah, I think one of the kind of uh, a few things like the example I gave is 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 simple where we are um, capturing the the heart rate information which you can get with instantaneously and can do an actuation that really without any lag, right? So that communication kind of aspect of uh, having no delay is really important. We try to do that in the context of voice. Again, you can. Um, do measurement, but people are percep uh, very perceptive to the notion of delay in, if they're uh, listening to their voice. So one example we did um, is um, where they would get a, a feedback in their ears where the voice was altered. So there, any little kind of change there will completely screw up the conversation. Um, the other thing is that becomes more kind of complicated of how do you act on multiple signals, right? Um, and accumulate multiple signals and what modality do you actuate on? The other thing is to kind of keep track of, of uh, one of the things is um, the adaptive aspect of it. So for example, um, one of the things where our, our um, signal um, sort of backfired was with the, the gate example that we did um, to where we were trying to actually get someone to walk faster. Oops. Sorry, Luca, are you saying something? Oh, no. Um, so uh, the uh, gate example it actually had a negative impact on heart rate. So some people, we actually ended up getting people to change their gait, but also impact their heart rate. So how do you kind of keep track of that multimodality of changes and adapt that um, actuation in a more intelligent way? This was just one signal that we are measuring and actuating. I think that multimodal aspect of it and how do you adapt dynamically and also do it with um, without the conscious perception that you are doing it that um, interferes with their actual um, um, task is, is some of the things that we've been kind of thinking about. So I'm going to actually uh, focus on mobile health and then move to CubeSat so that we have continuity. Um, I'm going to ask Anja's question, such as, can you comment on the ethics of 
reporting incorrect or manipulated data to a user of a mobile health application. I think, I think and more broadly, the other question is also about privacy. Once you're collecting more of this information, and you're actually starting to affect the human behavior. What are your implications of ethics and privacy? Yeah, so we did two versions of this um, experiment, one where we didn't tell the user and the other time where we told the user that we might um, um, r randomly actuate, give them feedback that is not um, accurate. We're going to alter that feedback. Um, and we saw the similar effect. So the one is that will the effect last if the person knows that the effect is happening or alteration is happening. So the good news is that we can still have the, uh, the, the effect persist. The second is whether it's um, ethical or not. I think there um, we were having users authentication uh, like um, authorization is is very important right we uh in the context of kind of the the testing that you can say that this might help you and um it's your choice just like sensing permission right right now pretty much it's default that you would get the permission for sensing and if the user is um, but at the same time there is a risk right so we need to have, think about and i think that's another thing about we have not at all um, looked into kind of um, the security aspect right can someone tamper with that signal and send a false signal that as you saw that maybe we we're trying to calm something down and someone who um is is in a competitive exam context is trying to hack into the signal and making their classmates do worse right so i think there are aspects there that has to that has to be handled uh, which we haven't done at all but i think the biggest thing in the context of sensing is i uh, think uh, uh, similar to sensing, I think the users should understand what's happening and the users need to kind of give permission and have control over, over the actuation. Perfect. So uh, Luca, uh, we want to shift a little bit to CubeSats and one of the questions uh, Romain had was what is the bigger vision of these CubeSats? Uh, what kind of a sensing are they? What are the applications? And are you talking about having cameras up there? What kind of a sensors? So if you can talk a little bit about that, that will be great. So right now, I think the primary direction is, uh, is to deploy there uh, some sort of camera by, through which you can do uh, some form of remote monitoring. Uh, for example, there's a lot of effort into developing the RF cameras by which you can uh, monitoring the movement of glaciers, for example, uh, understand better what are the phenomena in the environment that affect the pollution in different areas of the earth. So uh, remote, remote sensing through satellites is not new. Uh, what CubeSats are doing is basically to democratize that, to allow not just NASA or uh, like the national space agencies, um, to put sensors up there for your own specific application um, and have the data delivered directly to you instead of through, you know, many third parties that you cannot even trust, perhaps. Um, another interesting direction, uh, which I think is definitely going to happen because I see many efforts going that way, is to put up there not just one CubeSat, but what's called a constellation of CubeSats, so a truly distributed system in space where the individual devices can coordinate uh, and achieve in a distributed fashion something that perhaps would require one big large satellite, uh, but now you can achieve with uh, tens of hundreds of small CubeSats that we perhaps can put up, up there, not just, just NASA. And I, I find that really fascinating because you can start imagining like a, the version of Planet Lab uh, with the constellation of CubeSats. It should be, and people can program them and run different kind of protocols. Uh, that would be really amazing. I guess the thing which I'm really, I would like, I'd like you to share a little bit about with the audience is what is the process? Because this is like, you're creating the sensor, you're creating a CubeSat. How is that different from creating a normal sensor system? Uh, and second, what is the process of actually, what's the timeline for getting it all the way up into the space. So it, it's, uh, okay, keep in mind right now, there's not really a stable process for doing that. Um, it all depends on the specific opportunities you have. So uh, if you wanted, you could start developing a CubeSat from scratch 
uh, get in touch with one of those private companies that organize uh, um, periodic launches using their own launch rockets and basically do everything internally. At some point, you would deliver your CubeSat as it is to these people uh, and they would load it on the rocket and at some point you'll start receiving data <laughs> uh, magically. Um, if you go, so if you do things that way, uh, you should be prepared to spend roughly, I would say half a million euros for one CubeSat. Everything included, turnkey solution. Um, we, don't, we didn't have half a million euros. Uh, and we still don't have it for, for our own CubeSat research. So what we do is, and what I would actually suggest most people in the audience to do if they're interested in, in, in starting research in this area is to, is to piggyback your work on an existing CubeSat program. And there's, uh, there, there are many of them. Uh, for example, in our case, we have been establishing a, a, a nice collaboration with the Indian Space Agency uh, the, the work on Hummingbird, for example, uh, was not carried by CubeSat per se. Uh, on that same CubeSat, there were like four or five other systems um, experimenting and, and researching totally different problems, and we only have had one CubeSat, basically. So you share the cost, but most importantly, uh, you can uh, you know, pick, pick the brain of the people you work with um, and get up to speed much faster than compared to, you know, if, if you were alone doing this. Um, so so uh, uh, building on that, one of the things which was asked was like, what, how do you actually get all this data? If you're taking a camera data, how do you get that? What kind of a link do you use? Do you, are you using um, 60 gigahertz, millimeter wave? Are you using Wi-Fi? What kind of a link would work at that kind of a range to send so, something like a high definition uh, video? So we don't get the raw pictures. That's, that's one thing. Uh, what you do in most of the cases is to locally process the pictures and get down only the data you're really interested in. Um, because the, the, the RF capabilities are nowhere near, you know, what you would need to send down the raw pictures. Um, in our case, but it, again, it all depends on the specific CubeSat and the, the infrastructure of the, the supporting company you rely on. In our own work, uh, we have a very low bandwidth, long range proprietary protocol um, that we can actually, we don't touch it. We have an API uh, to the RF subsystem of the CubeSat. Uh, and there is a network of um, receivers on the earth that eventually get our data on a storage server. Uh, in full honesty, we have no idea how it ends up there. <laughs> Uh, we have the API on the CubeSat, and we know that if everything works, eventually we find the data on that storage server. Um, so this is, this is the, the drawback of this kind of things. I mean, uh, it's, it's really a totally vision and, and uncharted territory. So there's not really a stable process. There's not really a stable architecture or anything. Something I'm involved in that I think it would be really important here is, is to define a common architecture for the CubeSat at least to, to start with. So that, for example, like, you know, let me get back to the Planet Lab analogy. Um, if I want to test X and Y, I know that the APIs I have are these and these and that, and I know that the rest of the system looks like this. So I know exactly what I need to connect to what to do my own research. Um, but in full honesty, we are kind of far from anything like that. It's, it's really uh, pretty much a hard hoc, ad hoc process right now. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit uh, and get in uh, Tanzim. One of the questions which I think is on everyone's mind is, as grad students are listening to this, what kind of a future mobile health applications do you uh, think are useful and worthy for the research community to work on? And I think with COVID-19, um, that's also the kind of the question, right? Is that a short-term question? Uh, do you think that is that other interesting and uh, impactful problems we can work on even for COVID-19? Yeah, I think um, uh, there is definitely a, a lot of interesting kind of problem. And I think it's a great time to kind of think about that because with COVID-19, although um, it 
it's terrible, but I think it, at least within the U.S., it will cause a shift in in healthcare and and get uh, a lot of people to change how healthcare is um, reimbursed and all those things that have been a barrier so far in terms of um, in terms of really leveraging and taking advantage of a lot of technology solutions. Right, we've seen um, even kind of Medicare, Medicaid making quick decisions, FDA approving things more quickly just because of the of the demand. So I think now is the perfect time. Um, so with, with COVID-19 uh, particularly, I think there is a lot of interesting uh, work to be um, done in thinking about what do you need to measure beyond contact tracing, of course, right? So there are there are work that I'm doing, including um, Raja Lakshmi, your former student, right? In, in thinking about how can you track symptoms in a contactless way without burdening the users beyond the hospital, right? So, and the other thing is that even with, with us, with a, like, there is no way um, with major hospitals that they uh, get even pulse ox reading um, that are, that, that, that can that can warn the physician. Most people don't buy a pulse ox, right? So can you? How can you even build? Think about new types of like a co commodity hardware-based sensing and something that uh, we've been uh, working on. So and beyond that, I think uh, there is the aspect of health as an as an ecosystem, right? So when we often think about um, the the patient and the and the doctor, but as soon as you leave the doctor's office, it's not just it's not just the patient and the doctor, it's, it's their caregiver. And caregiver can come in very, very, very different form, right? For um, children, it's their parents. For elders, it could be a family member. There would be people who suffer chronic illness or recovering from a uh, kind of surgery. There is a long-term aspect of it. And I think um, there, um, how do we kind of bring in the expertise of, of, the, of the doctor in the moment um, and actuate and measure, right? So I think there is a lot of opportunities of AR, VR in terms of if someone is even, if you have to inject something every day, are you doing it right, right? If you have to do blood draws, um, can you do it right? And how can you actually guide someone who doesn't need to be an expert phlebotomist to actually intervene on themselves. Um, so it's not where you would put um, very expensive robotics there, right? So I think there is this whole kind of notion when we talk about kind of immersive care is you need to think about what tele going just the telemedicine where it's video conversation to actually making it interaction in the doctor's office where you're measuring things, you're looking at responsiveness and reacting and actually enabling the, the, the patient or the person with them to actuate on the users in an accurate way. So that's, I think there's a lot of problems there in terms of how do you, how do you get a task done uh, where you are, um, you're doing labs on the on the users in in their home and and also um, bringing in what it's a partnership between kind of the caregiver as well as the um, uh, as well as the patient. So in one example, we uh, one of my colleagues who work on it is with home health aides, right? And that's been a very interesting kind of dynamics because they're also a risk factor. Home health aides are actually treating the vulnerable. They're going between different houses. In New York City, they were taking the public transport. So understanding how, how we can measure and use these human resources in a safe manner is also another, another interesting aspect of where um, embedded tracking can be very helpful. So I, I, I really, I really appreciate what you just said, which is basically with COVID-19, one of the, if only any positive uh, things has been that the healthcare system has been very, very uh, pushing back any kind of a mobile health applications for the last two decades. But with COVID-19, they've been forced to really adopt. So it kind of feels like the gold rush of mobile health where lots of the changes are happening and finally mobile technology is getting adopted. There's a lot of remote monitoring, the bandwidth requirement, everything is basically actually transforming in the healthcare system. So I think it is actually people, if grad students are looking for impact, 
uh, this is the time to work on uh, mobile health or embedded systems for health because you can actually potentially get your system uh, to change the lives and, uh, of multiple people. So one question which I wanted to bring both of you, both of your input uh, towards is, it seems like in both your, both the kind of projects you guys do, it's very interdisciplinary in nature. You do things which are systems, networking, embedded systems, health in the case of uh, Tanzim and in the case of uh, Luca, you're interfacing with uh, people who are building satellites and shooting rockets. Um, so how do you get students excited? Then this, this, these, are, these are longer term than just writing a paper, or having an idea and simulating things. It's much longer term because you need to basically um, implement all these things and learn. You, you don't have one just bag of tricks. You can just keep hammering to multiple things. It's more of like you need to learn multiple domains and build real systems which can be deployed. What is your advice and how do you navigate this whole uh, path for grad students and yourself? You can probably start with Tanzim and then we can go to okay. Luke. So um, I think that's something that I've, I've, uh, I had to deal with kind of throughout my, my um, uh, career is like, who, who am I? And I think I, I still, um, that's, a, that's a valid question uh, for me. And I think one of the things that really, um, I, I would say is, if you think about the, the impact in, like what does impact mean, uh, mean for an individual, right? So it can be, uh, there, are, there are kind of paths to having, having paper in top tier venues, but um, I think if one of the things that um, as, as faculty and as institution, I think we should kind of push also is that um, as, as computer science and, and all the work that we do grows, it is interfacing with society and um, ultimately we would have lasting impact um, by taking on larger problems, but also making it clear that there are really interesting technical content there. Um, so I think it, it's from a faculty's point of view, I think it is important for all of us to highlight where the technical problem is, where there are risks and, and, and kind of thinking about mitigating risk. Um, so I think one thing that was very helpful for me is, is choosing a community that is accepting of, of the work that we do um, and as willing to kind of grow. Um, so, and for, for me, it's been kind of straddling between communities as well, to a certain extent. So I, I've been involved in kind of uh, Mobisys, Census, uh, community as well, quite a lot. Um, I would say my home community has been Ubicom and, and really choose, choose the right community and it's okay to sometimes travel be, between the communities to, to give, um, uh, give the right exposure for the work where it will get adopted. And then of course, then there is the cross-disciplinary venues of um, clinical kind of venues where, uh, where maybe, um, that is something where you try to do kind of your most impactful clinical work. So having that balance, I think, is important. And and the other is to also highlight. I think um, uh, in in a lot of the cases who have been done a lot of kind of interdisciplinary work, students have have gone on to really interesting jobs and even academic positions. So um, that, that can be a motivation of how, how, um, how, how people have achieved success in different ways and, and highlighting those. But at the same time, there is, there is probably more, it, it requires more um, openness to risk taking. I think we are actually running out of time. So I would like to thank both the panelists, Luca and Tanzim. Thanks a lot. Uh, there are a couple of outstanding questions on the Slack, so if you can answer. Um, so the next session is on wireless, and uh, Aaron is going to be leading it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.